President John Fitzgerald Kennedy's limousine turns into Dallas's Dealey Plaza at 12.29 p.m. November 22, 1963. As joyous crowds cheer their beloved president, a sniper's bullet strikes him in the back. Shortly after, the fatal shot is delivered to the back of his head, releasing bloody fragments of critical brain matter. From a grassy knoll across the street, one of the official snipers dressed in a police uniform makes his escape, seemingly vanishing into thin air. At that exact moment, a CIA-paid mind-controlled assassin throws down a rifle and starts running. Wait a minute, you're thinking? That's not the story I've heard! Well, tell us what you think about this alternative history after you watch this official version. Has it changed since those 13,173 CIA documents were recently declassified? Minus one minute. John Kennedy sits in the back on the right side of the modified 1961 Lincoln Continental four-door convertible. His wife Jacqueline is next to him. In front of them are the Texas governor John Connolly and his wife Nellie. Secret Service agents are in the front seats. The mood is joyous in the back. As crowds clap and tell the president how much he's adored, Nellie turns to him and said, Mr. President, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you. Indeed, just a year before, Kennedy had deftly and humanely handled the Cuban Missile Crisis as the world watched, fearing an imminent nuclear war with the Soviet Union. Had it been up to his military advisors and other hawks in Washington, that war might well have happened. And possibly, you wouldn't be watching this video today. JFK had averted a possible apocalypse, and the people put their hopes in him for that. But not everyone in Washington applauded Mr. Kennedy for sorting things out with the Soviet leader Nikita Khrushchev. Far from it. Kennedy was a danger to their dangerous aspirations, sometimes too liberal for his own good. For most of the military-industrial complex, he was not the right man for the job. He was a virtual traitor to some factions of American power for wanting to pull out of Vietnam and for not coming down hard enough on the so-called commies. Did any of this affect what happened next? One minute after. Just after the first shot hits the president in the back, Secret Service agent Clinton Hill isn't sure what's happened. Like many people, he thinks the bang is a firecracker. Nonetheless, he runs from the follow-up car toward Kennedy's car, only for that second shot to take off the back of the president's head. Governor Connolly is also hit. Amazingly, given the number of shots allegedly fired, Kennedy is already close to death and Connolly has injuries to his back, left thigh, the right side of his chest, and right wrist. Only two bullets hit, and the other, well, no one knows where it ended up. This means one of the bullets went through Kennedy and then through Connolly, doing so many turns some people will later call it magic. At this point, Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry, traveling in the lead car, has already registered his call, stating the president has been shot. It's a busy minute. Lee Harvey Oswald, a former U.S. Marine who in 1959 defected to the Soviet Union, has just left the place from where he opened fire. This was a window on the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository Building. Police will soon be searching the building and find the murder weapon a 6.5mm Carcano rifle that Oswald had bought by mail order along with a telescopic sight some months earlier. He paid $19.95, about $180 in today's money. In his haste to get away, Oswald has not bothered to clean up three bullet casings close to where he did the deed. Two minutes. The president's motorcade, now traveling with two men in serious condition, begins its race to Parkland Memorial Hospital, which is about four miles away. At the head of the motorcade are the motorbikes. The whole entourage is moving about 70 miles per hour down Stemmons Freeway and Harry Hines. Not everyone fully understanding the depth of what's just happened. The hospital has been informed and police from elsewhere are on their way. Patrolman Marion Baker stops Oswald in the depository cafeteria, but he can walk away since the building superintendent vouches for him as an employee. Oswald is an employee, that's a fact. On this day though, some staff had seen him with a brown bag. Little did they know, it contained a rifle. No one knows much about Oswald, a man who some people will later call a Manchurian candidate, a victim of psychedelic mind control. Three minutes. Oswald gets on a bus to the downtown area. At this point, there's pandemonium back where the assassination happened. Police are talking to people who were there. Some of them seem to think the shots came from a grassy knoll. In fact, a lot of them are saying they believe the shots came from that knoll, but others are saying they think the shots came from a window high up in the building across the street. Some of them think the shots came from both places. Five minutes. The presidential limousine arrives at the hospital, followed by the follow-up car and the vice president's car. The hospital's already prepared two rooms, even though they're only aware right now that one person has been shot. There are 12 doctors, surgeons, a chief neurologist, anesthesiologists, a urological surgeon, an oral surgeon, and a heart specialist, all waiting for Kennedy. 
An agent covers the president's head so no one around can take photos. Mr. Connolly tries to get himself up from the car but collapses. Mrs. Kennedy, who is cradling her husband's head, covered in blood, at first doesn't want to let him go. Six minutes. Dr. Charles J. Carrico, a resident in general surgery, is the first person to get a good look at the president. It is a grim sight even for a surgeon. He is drip white, his breathing is very labored, and he is not moving. When a light is shown in Mr. Kennedy's eyes, the pupils remain dilated and show no reaction. These are serious signs. More serious is the fact that he doesn't have a pulse. But after listening to Kennedy's chest, Carrico can at least hear a faint heartbeat. The president of the so-called free world is not dead, but he is close to dead. 7 minutes. Oswald has just gotten off the bus and hailed the taxi. 8 minutes. Dr. Carrico is examining the president's head. From a hole, he sees what he calls considerable slow oozing. The president is struggling to breathe because of the injury to his neck, so the doctor uses a tube to hook him up to a breathing machine. Dr. Malcolm O. Perry comes into the scene, as do other doctors. They can see that the president's wounds, including significant head trauma, blood in his chest cavity, and his brain cerebellum hanging out, are probably not survivable. 9 minutes. Oswald's in the taxi and is heading toward his rooming house in Oak Cliff, a suburb of Dallas. Oswald's been renting this place for 8 bucks a week. It was ideally located just 2 miles from the book depository. He only stays there on weekdays and returns to his family home on weekends, where his wife and young kids are. His second daughter is just 33 days old. 12 minutes. Police are only just sealing off the book depository building. They're about to seal off the streets where the assassination happened. Up until now, cars have been driving up and down them as if nothing has happened. 18 minutes. The doctors and surgeons at the hospital admit that any further efforts to treat the president are futile. Admiral Berkeley, the president's physician, accepts that his president is not coming back. It's game over. 22 minutes. Father Oscar L. Huber is about to administer the last rites to the president. The mood is somber, to say the least. At this point, the Secret Service is making sure no one who shouldn't be there can get into any of the hallways close to where the president's body is. All this time, Mrs. Kennedy has been intermittently walking in and out of the room. She knows he can't be saved, but she refuses to leave the scene, even after being told to get some rest. She doesn't want to leave her husband's body, so she'll soon appear in front of TV cameras still covered in blood. When asked by aides to clean up, she tells them, let them see what they've done to my husband. She'll always be suspicious about who killed her husband. Some of Kennedy's family will also think there was a bigger conspiracy than the official story. Some still do now. 30 minutes. 1 p.m. is written on the death certificate. There's now a bit of a debate as to what happened to the body since Dallas officials have said the right thing to do now would be to perform an autopsy at the hospital. After all, this is a criminal matter. Never mind who the victim is, the law states his body should stay in Dallas for now. White House officials don't see it that way. They want the body to be loaded into a casket and with the rest of the entourage driven to Love Airfield, where the president had earlier landed and then flown back to Washington. They get their own way, of course, but this will be more fuel for the fire for those who will later challenge the official story. 40 minutes. Oswald's housekeeper, the rather grandmotherly-looking Mrs. Earlene Roberts, is watching the news on the TV about her dear president being shot. Suddenly, Oswald bursts into the living room, looking like a man on a mission. She's never really liked him. He often acts weird, and unlike some of the other guests, he doesn't say much to her. When he bolts through the room, he goes straight to his own room, not even bothering to stop and look at the TV that's telling millions of Americans the bad news. At this point, the public still doesn't know JFK is dead. Walter Cronkite is telling viewers as much as he knows that Governor Connolly and the president have been hit, but the women are physically okay. Cronkite announces there's no word at all, no official word, from the doctors or the White House staff on the extent of the president's wounds. As we said, there has been no word at all on the official word from the doctors at Parkland Hospital or the White House staff on the… Ex at Oswald's family home, his wife Marina is crying. She's asking what will happen to Kennedy's wife and those lovely kids if he passes away. She has absolutely no idea her husband has played a starring role in this historical disaster and that her name will also be recorded in the annals of America's rich history of violence. 43 minutes. Oswald's about to leave the boarding house with his fawn jacket in his hand. Mrs. Roberts says to him, you're in a hurry, aren't you? As usual, Oswald doesn't give her a second glance and he leaves without so much as saying bye. 45 minutes. Oswald's walking at a brisk pace or perhaps even running. He's less than a mile away from the boarding house when he's stopped by a police officer named J.D. Tippett. Tippett's been working on his regular beat when he heard the news about the assassination attempt. All police in the area were told witnesses had seen a man acting suspiciously and it was likely he hadn't gotten far. 
The man was described as being a slender white male likely in his early 30s and about 5 foot 10 inches tall. He was actually very close to Oswald's appearance. At this point, Tippett is driving down the street when he thinks he sees a guy who could fit that description. It's Oswald. He drives over to him with the window now down. He has some words with Oswald. He then gets out of the car and walks toward Oswald, who fires off five rounds. Three hit Tippett in the chest, and another bullet hits him in the temple. Thirteen people in all witness this, and they watch Oswald take off afterwards. 52 minutes. Police cars are buzzing around everywhere now. Oswald's still marching down the street. 55 minutes. Tippett is pronounced dead at Methodist Hospital after being taken there by ambulance. 63 minutes. The press secretary for the White House is now going to tell the world the bad news. A bunch of U.S. reporters are waiting, all huddled in a nurse's classroom. As the press secretary walks into the room, there's chatter going on between the reporters, but things soon quiet down when they see the expression on the secretary's face. He announces, President John F. Kennedy died at approximately 1 p.m. CST today here in Dallas. He died of a gunshot wound to the brain. I have no other details regarding the assassination of the president. 65 minutes. Oswald has just been spotted by the manager of a shoe store. Oswald's gait and facial expression look suspicious. Guilt and desperation are written all over him. The manager also notices that when some police cars scream past, Oswald creeps into his store's entranceway and turns his head so as to not be seen. 66 minutes. The manager, sensing something is wrong, follows this mysterious man down the street, at which point he sees him take advantage of a movie theater ticket attendant. While she's not looking, Oswald sneaks inside without paying, but the manager sees this all clear as day. When Oswald is inside, the manager tells the attendant, after which she calls the cops. 70 minutes. Preparations are being made to send the president's casket to the airfield. 80 minutes. Over 20 cops and a handful of detectives turn up at the cinema where Oswald is watching a movie called War is Hell. What's your fussing with it for? Why don't you dump it? The army's paying me to be a radio man, so that's what I'm doing. 81 minutes. Police surround Oswald. He puts up a bit of a fight at first. He pulls out his gun only for an officer named Nick McDonald to smack him in the face and suppress Oswald's efforts to use the firearm. Oswald is soon down on the floor, shouting, Well, it's all over now. Hour 3. During the interrogation, Oswald denies all wrongdoing. Captain J.W. Fritz writes that down, and he also notes that Oswald has said that a photograph of him in his backyard holding a rifle is a fake. He says he's never even owned a rifle. For some strange reason, none of this interrogation is recorded on tape, even though Captain Fritz has asked for a recorder. Even just as weird is that no stenographer is present. Hour 4. Oswald is taken downstairs to stand in a lineup. For some reason, he gets searched at this point in time for the first time. Police find five cartridges. Hour 7. Oswald is brought out like a circus animal to speak to the press. This instance in American history is kind of a watershed moment when bad news also functions as entertainment for the masses. Bringing him out in front of the cameras like this is very unusual indeed. Oswald seems nervous. He's a bit bruised from his beating. He seems surprised when he's asked about killing the president. As far as he's concerned, he's being charged with Officer Tippett's death only. Uh, the first thing I heard about it was when the newspaper reporters in the hall. Hour seven and a half. Oswald is taken by police outside again, where he is dragged past reporters. It's at this point that he says something that will stick with the Americans for many years to come. I have any. I, uh, I don't know what this is all about. I killed the president. No, sir, I didn't keep it the Sir? Did you shoot the president? I work. He says, I'd like some legal representation. These police officers have not allowed me to have any. I don't know what this is all about. Reporters keep asking him, did you kill the president? In what comes across as being frustrated, Oswald uses a sterner tone to say, they've taken me in because of the fact that I lived in the Soviet Union. I'm just a patsy, meaning he thinks he's being set up for something he hasn't done. At around the same time, a pathologist at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Maryland is just starting his examination of the president's body. Hour 23. It's only now that Oswald is charged with the murder of Kennedy. He denies everything, including the murder of Tippett. Hour 36. Military pallbearers carry a flag-covered coffin containing the president to the East Room at the White House. It will later be taken by horse and carriage to the Capitol. Hundreds of thousands of Americans will come to pay their respects. Hour 45. A nightclub owner named Jack Ruby is making his way to the Dallas Police HQ, where Oswald is being kept. Ruby has a colorful history. He's a nightclub owner who might have connections with various people in organized crime. Still, he is no killer. He can have no idea that for many decades to come, people all over the world will labor in confusion as to what kind of a man he is. Right now, he's a man holding a gun. 
Hour 47, Ruby makes his way down into the basement of the police headquarters. How he actually gets into the HQ will be a mystery. He shouldn't have been able to do that so easily with no police or press ID. After all, half of the USA would have liked to have killed the man they think killed their president. Hour 48. As police escort Oswald through a crowd of reporters, Ruby pushes his way through, and with a revolver, he shoots Oswald in the abdomen, causing catastrophic injuries to Oswald's internal organs. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. Absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Oswald falls to the ground and starts groaning in agony. The question is, why has Ruby done this? Did he love the president that much? Or was this something to do with the organized crime and the fact that Robert Kennedy, John's brother, the attorney general, has been cracking down on the mafia? Robert will be assassinated in strange circumstances in five years' time during a presidential campaign that might well have seen him win. Yet again, some people will say the CIA was involved and the killer was a Manchurian candidate. Some of the Kennedy family will say that now two Kennedys have been taken out by the US government. Back to the basement, Ruby is immediately arrested. Hour 50. Oswald is pronounced dead at Parkland Memorial Hospital, the same place where the president had died. Day 150. During the time that Ruby was in prison, he'd written a few times to the Warren Commission, the team tasked with investigating the death of JFK and finding out if there really was just one gunman. Ruby said in his letters that his life was in danger. He said in one letter, I want to tell the truth and I can't tell it here. The commission said they couldn't help him. We may never know what was on Ruby's mind because of what happens next. Day 180. Dr. Louis Jollyon Jolly West visits Ruby in his cell. He writes a psychological evaluation in which he states that Ruby is psychotic. This is strange because before this, even just days before, other people say that Ruby was in a fine mental state. West wrote that he'd suffered an acute psychotic break. He'd gone mad, according to West, and you can't trust what madmen say. You need to know something about West, one of the creepiest characters in modern US history, the man some people say was capable of creating Manchurian candidates. For years, he'd been part of the CIA's so-called brain warfare program MKUltra, a secret and dark series of experiments in which the CIA tested powerful psychedelic drugs on people in order to control their minds. The CIA didn't want Russia to get there before America, and these powerful drugs were still fairly new. The CIA wanted to weaponize LSD, although it later escaped underground government black sites, and thanks to people such as novelist Ken Kesey of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, it kicked off a cultural movement that made people grow their hair long talk about love and peace and vastly improve popular music. Dr. West is a leading guy where the hunt for the truth serum is concerned. Not long after he has that visit with Ruby, he'll be doing experiments at his clinic in Haight-Ashbury, where he'll perform them on young folks, some of them who run in the same circles as the likes of Charles Manson. The CIA will later try to destroy these files and all files connected with MKUltra, but it will fail and the news will get out. The question some people have been asking is, did West use some of his mind control magic on Ruby and manage to turn a sane man psychotic more or less overnight, perhaps so he wouldn't talk? Day 200. The New York Times had just published the headline, Mind Expert Says Ruby Was Insane. This was at a time when Ruby was due to testify in court. The article explains that Ruby is insane and he was when he killed Oswald. The story states that Ruby loved Kennedy and this crazy kind of love drove him to do what he did. A doctor speaking with the Times called Ruby a mental cripple who may have had homosexual fantasies about JFK. The doctor added, he's a very vulnerable individual, and he might either crack up on the witness stand or present a more normal aspect than I would expect. I think this man could become flagrantly psychotic. That would sure come in handy if Ruby knew something that someone powerful didn't want to come out. It's also strange because a book by writer Tom O'Neill shows that plenty of other people went to see Ruby and said he was perfectly sane. This is one reason among many why a rabbit hole opened regarding this case, a hole whose protean chambers and antechambers just keep expanding the more people dug. Year 4. Jack Ruby, who's been sick for a long time, finally succumbs to various illnesses in prison. He never does get to have a second trial and speak his mind. He dies just days before he's supposed to have his day in court. Year 13. After the CIA tried to destroy all its files about its mind control experiments, the Justice Department in 1976 orders a full investigation. The New York Times will later say the investigation was quietly dropped. Year 59, December 2022. Finally, the CIA opens more files after promising to do it for many years, but half of them are covered with black ink 
with the word redacted painted all over them. The CIA has also decided it wants to keep about 4,000 files classified, for what reason journalists do not know, to hide something about its part in the assassination or to merely suppress official incompetence, or is the CIA just concerned activities back then, even tenuously linked with JFK, wouldn't look too great now? The newly declassified data dump is not a smoking gun, as some news media say. It's not even the slightest. But perhaps the omission of data shows us that the CIA is still holding an undetonated bomb. Until every piece of that JFK jigsaw is handed over, the picture will always be incomplete. The story hasn't ended yet. Perhaps Oswald and Ruby were both Manchurian candidates. Or maybe they were just angry head cases with something to prove. Now you need to hear more about Oswald and the crazy true story of the man who killed JFK, or hear more about the CIA's mind control experiments in Inside the CIA's Terrifying Sleep Room.